I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the Associate Dean of Midwifery and Women's Health. And then I see that's me handing it over to whoever's going to introduce themselves next. Diana Jollis, I'm uh, one of the faculty members here at Frontier. I teach the last of the professional role development courses. I'm a nurse midwife. I live in Arizona, and I was an RCF for three years prior to becoming course faculty. And RCF uh, is the regional clinical faculty for those new to Frontier. And uh, I'm Jane Houston, the new clinical director for midwifery and women's health and uh, I live in Florida but you can probably tell I'm not actually originally from Florida I'm from Scotland in case any of you out there are wondering about my funny accent I will be taking care of Hawaii and the international sites as the regional clinical faculty as well and I really look forward to your success and I look forward to working with all of you Okay, so I'm going to just briefly go back through these slides. So basically, this one is exactly what it looks like. We make plans that are straightforward, but um, the truth of what normally happens is that it's not nearly as straightforward as we hope. And midwifery school is often the same way. Life occurs during midwifery school, and even within school itself, sometimes there are bumps and jiggles and unexpected turns and twists along the way. Um, but eventually, you can still end up at your goal. So the ability to be able to tolerate that is very valuable. So then one of the questions that we had previously gotten was, can you give us some suggestions for making the most of this learning experience? Um, and so some of the, in summary, what we said is one thing is to broaden your mind, be ready to look and see things in different ways. Um, you know, as you go through coursework, Sometimes the light is shown for ha ha, but don't bump. The light is shown on different aspects of um, what you're learning of midwifery, the different role pieces and the different important parts. And so, be willing to think differently than you thought before, to stretch yourself, to be flexible, and to understand that you're seeing often seeing parts at a time and not necessarily seeing the whole. And um, to understand that. While you may have gotten through your undergrad and you may have had another graduate degree, you may have had a full point of coming into this program. That may or may not happen as you finish this because it is a different way of thinking. It um, And this profession as a whole, you know, one of the things that I always say, and I hope you'll understand what I mean by this, there's absolutely no room for error in obstetrical care, and yet there's no way to avoid it. Like, there's no room for it when you think about malpractice and you think about people's expectations and you think about your own expectations. We want things to be perfect every time. But the truth of the matter is, first off, a lot of it is out of our control. And secondly, we are human and mistakes are made, and that's true for school as well. And so um, absolutely strive to be excellent, but do not berate yourself if you're not perfect every single time. And nursing school uh, tests and midwifery tests all have the common commonality that, um, that the answer is not always black and white. And sometimes there's more than one, quote, acceptable answer, but we're looking for the best answer. That is accumulation of everything that you've learned um, moving toward an exam or toward um, an assessment. And now we're caught back up. So when in thinking about when we got our heads together about how to make the best of the learning experiences you're about to have, we wanted to remind you to do everything you can to apply the assignments that you'll have throughout your coursework at Frontier to real life opportunities. Um, the ACNM, ABC, your local chapters, your regional chapters, there are so many opportunities. The profession is um, largely volunteer run. So a lot of the divisions, all of the divisions of the American College of Nurse Midwives are run by volunteers. So there's a plethora of opportunities for you. So um, seek opportunities and, and really try to use your assignments to give to the profession. So if you're doing a needs assessment in one co in a course, share it with the practice that's in your town so that they're able to use it to write grants and things like that. 
There are lots of great stories of frontier students that have applied their coursework to local and regional projects and, and really made a big difference. And it will benefit you in your networking and in your ability to secure preceptors. So obviously, if anyone has been to Frontier Bound yet, you know uh, how important your cohort is and the relationships that you make. And so when we think about how to really make the most of the experiences and learning opportunities that you have at Frontier, there's so much to say about the community. So it, whether it's the community of colleagues that you have, whether it's connections you've made during group projects and in your coursework, whether it's relationships that you have with your faculty or on the student council, um, there's lots of opportunity to stay connected and to, to support each other. So leverage the diversity and the opportunity that you have here at Frontier to make those connections. <clears throat> Case studies are another really important way to do that. So we wanted to point out this, because when we talk about making the best of the experiences, you'll you'll hear this concept over and over all the way through your your DMP program. But everything you do in life, especially in the chaotic clinical environment, involves receiving signals from your environment. You're constantly getting signals. Um, and what you need to start to learn to do is dis distinguish the signal from noise. A lot of noise will come to you. So there's wonderful things that are going on. For example, I'll use um, the Frontier student Facebook pages where students are uniting and communicating and creating really strong bonds and communication. But as an advisor, I can say that there are times where I find myself having to teach my students to distinguish the signal from the noise because they get distracted by what can really be noise. So sometimes you remember being told by your grandmother that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Sometimes as communities um, grow, you find that people who are vocal or disturbed will wind up saying things and speaking things. And sometimes it can be confusing to figure out what's really a, a true message and, and what should get you off track. So just try to think of that as you're going through. Develop your professional skills. This happens on every nursing unit in every clinic. This is a very real experience. So use your time at Frontier like a playground and imagine this is my next um, community health center and this type of cultural issue is coming up and how am I going to demonstrate to be the change to lead in a positive way and help others really stay on track and stay positive. Another thing that you can do is to make sure that um, that you're surrounding yourself with people with the same vision. And so part of that means surrounding yourself with and seeking out mentors and preceptors that can contribute to your education. And so um, for those of you who are looking for a preceptor right now, you all going to raise your hand on the same. Raise your hand if you do not yet have a preceptor. Let's go with that. Raise your hand on the little me, 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 me. I see a couple of me's. So one of the things, one of the um, pieces of advice that Dean Marfell sometimes gives is figure out who in your community you feel is the best nurse midwife and go to them and say that. Say, I really feel like you're the best nurse midwife around here. And I would love to learn from you. People have a hard time rejecting flattery. Um, it'll get you everywhere. That's what people say, right? And so people understand sincerity. And so looking for people that have the same belief systems, you know, not every preceptor is created equal. Not every student is created equal. So you, you want to have a good matchup whenever possible. You may have to travel outside of your immediate community. I always like to say that because to find the right preceptor, and to be honest, sometimes to find any preceptor that is necessary. I had to travel. I live in rural Georgia, and um, I had to travel to Atlanta for a preceptorship. So it's about three and a half hours away, and so I would go for a few days at a time, four or five days, come home for a couple of days and back and forth. But Ginger, you're right, networking, networking, networking. The local and, oh, Regina, seven hours is a long way to go for clinical, but if you get a great experience, it's well worth it. 
And you know what that says to me is that there must not be many midwives in your community and what a benefit you're going to be to that community when you come back. So that is so, it's a sacrifice of love is what it is. That's the way I felt at the time is that it was a sacrifice of love to be able to do what I felt that I was called to do. So begin early to look for preceptors, look for preceptors and um, mentors that share the same vision. You know, you may find in a course that there's just something, even sometimes watching the um, big blue buttons or watching the Camtasia's that you connect with somebody, like you just feel like you're speaking the same language. Reach out to those faculty. They want to hear from you. Um, and you, they can't, they're not necessarily in a position to reach out to all of you personally. They're trying to make sure to be able to distribute the information in a way that's understandable and, and accessible. But if you reach out to them, they want to hear from you. And so that's part of mentoring as well. Oh, Lord, developing a script. This is another question. I think I need to take this section, and um, I probably won't even get to talk about this because it would not be correct, actually, for me to talk about it. Self-care. This is another question that we had from students. How do we develop a really good schedule so that we can balance all these things? Um, and Diana put these pictures together, and I love them. You can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to, we would never want you to sacrifice your family for school, ever. And you can take that to the bank. If you need to refloat me later, I want you to do it. But we do expect you to have school as a priority. And anything that you take on, like school, means that there's probably something in your life that you're having to give up. Not many people have. 40 or 50 hours a week just flipping around in their life that's not the way they're just sitting in front of the TV. Um, and so I just encourage you to be careful about looking after yourself so that you can, um, can do and be successful in all of the areas of your life. Yeah, that's about what I did during nursing school. How about y'all? Yeah, if I could not just much. quickly speak to this. Um... I think that really sums it up. I mean, we always say about if you're already working and there is a big thing about work-life balance, it's like having two full-time jobs because school becomes your first full-time job. Then maybe you've got a family and a partner. That's another full-time job looking after them. And then you've got your other job, which you have to make money. So um, adding on another job, having a social life, uh, something's going to... Um, crack so really thinking really strongly making sure your family and your partner are on the same page as you um, is really important and this is a good um, point as well that um, no one has ever said I feel so energized after a 12-hour shift so some people are a little unrealistic coming into school about what they can and can't achieve and if you're trying to work full-time and go to school full time and have a family and look after your partner it's not going to work as uh, Regina thank you for that comment Regina says on the side here I was working full time but I had to cut back to part time at work and I can actually still remember even though it was a long time ago I can still remember when I was in midwifery school and yeah I had to go part time it wasn't happening and then I went PRN when I was um, uh, doing basically um, in the clinical section because you can't actually possibly do two full-time jobs and look after yourself and your family so that's just a little tip uh, from me that you can't possibly be doing 80 to 100 hours uh, of work and study and be a sane person. I agree you know people think well I, I work 312 well that is a full-time job first off obviously and when you get home, it's not reasonable to think that you're going to be able to do um, any quality work or studying. It's not reasonable to think that. You might can put in a few hours, but you probably didn't get anything out of it. And then if you work three twelves, well, yes, you have four days off. But if you're like me, very often one day or at least half of two days was spent recovering or getting ready to work. So then in most people, I would say the majority plus of people cannot study for 12 hours straight and retain anything. Like three to four hour stints with a decent break in between is, is a more reasonable idea. And some people can't even do that. Like I'm a little bit ADHD. About an hour on task is about all you can get out of me. 
before I have to at least get up and away from whatever I'm doing for 10 or 15 minutes. And so by the time you've done that multiple times, you've lost several hours in the day. So um, Sophie says, do some students work? Yes, Sophie, actually most of our students do work some, but they, um, if they're working full time, we really recommend um, part time or plan B in school so that, so that the balance can be there. Um, Ginger says she plans on working 30 to 36 hours. If you're working that much, Ginger, I would recommend considering the part time. And simply because it is, it is difficult to, to squeeze all that in. And you're on maternity leave now, so you've got a baby to love on. And that is full time, like this full time kissing as far as I'm concerned. Full time sugar to the baby. And Michelle, yes, we agree that PRN during clin clinicals, if there's any way that you can arrange that, that that's wonderful. It's hard to balance. It's not impossible, but it is very difficult. So there you are, Ginger. That's what you're doing right now. You're doing an important work. And for those of the rest of you who might have young children or be considering um, babies, what you're doing is exhausting. It is You have a full-time job in that. And, you know, I did find, I'll tell you, as the kids got a little bit older, and when I say a little bit, even a few years older, like when you get home, if you give them a few minutes right then because you've been away from them, they don't care for you for long. They, can, they then run off and go do other things. But you have filled their cup a little bit right then when they've been feeling empty. And so that was just a tip that works. And actually, it still works even for my husband. Like when I walk in from a trip in my brain, I just have to be willing to give him some time right then. Um, Husband and I are planning more children. Should I wait until I'm done with school? If you have that option, I would say that's just smart simply because you never know physically what a pregnancy is going to bring, how you're going to feel, if you're going to be tired, and then additional children, it's additional responsibility. So I would say if you have that option, great. We do have folks with that have babies during school, but it is um, a challenge that if you can, you know, not add it to school time, that would probably be good. Um, I have three little ones going through undergrad, says Christina. When I finished, I realized they'd grown some cereal for dinner. Yeah, let me tell you what my kids said. And they don't say this laughingly. Now, they're currently 28, 25, and 22. And this is what the babies call when I was in school. They say it was the Burger King years. And they're not laughing when they say that. Um, their poor daddy took them to Burger King, I think, for supper every night. That's probably what led to my middle son obesity. You know us mothers, we're going to take all the blame. It's all my fault. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you to do for yourself. Always take a few minutes. Oh, that was bad. That was my fork. That was my healthy eating to the left over there. Um, always take a few minutes to do a few jumping jacks, jump up and down, get up and walk for a few minutes at a time. And literally, you know, I said earlier I'm a little ADHD, so about every hour or so I have to get up. You need to do that during school also. You're, you don't need to ignore your body. You know how your energy level will wax and wane, and it certainly um, is worse when you're not doing any, any regular physical activity. So about every hour to two hours, at the very least, I walk to the mailbox and back and contribute to my Fitbit. Miss Diana and I are in a competition, and I was on the treadmill at 5 a.m. this morning so that I would feel good all day. I have currently met my step goal for the day. How about you, Diana? That's going to be my evening activity. i got to catch uh -huh. up with you. <laughs> well, no, I was so down yesterday, but today I did do something, and I plan to do something tomorrow. So, you know, our taking care of our physical health has to be a priority so that your mental health follows behind. And uh, I love I love this uh, particular cartoon. It really speaks to my life on call as a midwife. I never I always used to say to people I never got jet lag during all the time I was on call twenty four seven for three years because I would never get jet lag going to other time zones because I could sleep and I can sleep anywhere. So for those of you that out, are out there that are worried, um, if you have a sleep disorder. Um, that you won't have one because you'll be able to sleep. I could catch five five minutes nap anywhere. And just so you're wondering, at 5 a.m. this morning, I was looking at the back of my eyelids. So, um, 
but do try and develop good sleep patterns because it's really difficult when you're on call all the time to get um, proper sleeps. And if you can, if you can learn to cat nap, it's a really good skill to have. If you don't, I feel sorry for midwives that don't cat nap because uh, that was always my saving grace. I could sleep anywhere. <laughs> Now, that was me when I got home Monday afternoon. We were at AABC over the weekend. Um, Diana and I were both there for different events. And um, I actually had kind of a taxing family week the week prior. And so I was exhausted going into AABC. I loved it. It was wonderful. But it, you know how sometimes those high energy things just, well, you're just zapped when you get done. When I got home Monday afternoon, literally I hit the doorstep around 4.30 or 5 o'clock. I was in my pajamas and in my bed at 5 p.m. I did not turn the TV on. I did not do anything, and I rose from the bed at 7 a.m. the next day. I think that's why I was sore all over, but it was I needed to hibernate. I just needed to unplug from everybody and everything. You see, no one is speaking because what we really wanted pictures of is red velvet cake and cupcakes here. But to really look, <laughs> Jane is laughing. I see you, but you're muted. Um, if you really want to take care of yourself, though, and be at your optimum performance, you have to look after yourself. 80% um, diet, 20% exercise as far as your overall physical body makeup you're wanting to lose weight or maintain weight, um, or actually even if you want to gain weight, the, the formula is 80% diet and 20% exercise to have your body where you want it. So um, this was my fruit that I spilled a minute ago when I did my little jumping jacks for y'all. Well, I think, Tony, I think this speaks really well to your life um, as a student. It's very important to try and eat um, healthy, and I know a lot of uh, – I am an American now, so I can say this, but our obsession with um, diet soda. Um, I mean, don't try and like just suddenly cut it out, but I'm trying to think about things like um, healthy things like water and tea and not sweet tea from the South. Uh, Miss Tonya, I know you're. I know you're from the south. I don't drink sweet tea. I know, but a lot of Southerners do. But I drink cold this tea now. But it's well, <laughs> so. I drink some during the day. But trying to think about um, eating, you know, eating really healthy and trying to think about the amount of sugar you're consuming. Because I know it makes you feel better after you've had a really horrible, difficult test or a really hard day studying. And chocolate is quite delicious. But everything as, um, who was it? Benjamin Franklin, right? Everything in moderation. That was my philosophy. So everything in moderation, if you can, um, because you want to have positive coping skills. Um, so trying to think about your diet. Oh yeah, and Heidi says Zumba. Well, about Zumba. Yeah, Zumba's awesome. We love Zumba. Yeah, Ginger, it's so easy when you're sitting studying or working on something at self comfort. You know, yeah, I ate my way through studies. I, I totally understand. Um, I fight weight every single day, and so yeah, Heidi, I, you know, I Zumba. I Zumba with the students when possible. I Zumba with myself. I Zumba. I Zumba with anybody that'll Zumba and um, so that I don't get back to my heaviest weight. Yeah. Diversity weekend, that's right. We were Zumba and up the crazy wall. Jane, you got anything to say about this one? Yeah, I'd love to speak to this. So um, there's a wonderful speaker we actually heard from a few weeks ago. If anyone has a chance, Mimi Secor, and I'll put her name in the sidebar uh, for those of you that are on live at the moment. But Mimi Secor, um, she's actually a family nurse practitioner and um, she's a wonderful person to talk about um, living positively and thinking about mindfulness and um, basically about your spirituality. I always think um, midwifery is a science and an art, and there's certainly a spiritual aspect to it. And um, I always uh, tell the students, you know, you have to take care of yourself, number one, because if you fall down, then 
you're not going to be able to do your job, you're not going to be able to look after your family or your partner. So really practicing mindfulness and being thankful for things each day and thinking about the spirituality of what you're doing um, actually as well as as well as the art and the science. Um, but really mindfully um, practicing midwifery is very important. I just want to say that I want my leg to look like that. Are that, are that, any of those, any of those six legs. That's pretty amazing. And this so, is, yeah, uh, pick up something, this, pick something for yourself that makes you feel good, right, Diana? That's right. And the importance of staying well rounded and having a hobby. Um, if you don't have one, it's never too late. I'm always impressed with when we go to conferences, watching, you know, people pull out these gorgeous needle points or um, just to hear about all the different horseback riding hobbies and things like that. So it's stay well-rounded. It'll suit you well and it'll be good for your patients. <laughs> Heidi says she just brought colored pencils to do adult coloring books and Sophie says they don't study all day. When I was in midwifery school, Heidi, I'm sure somebody still makes them. They have these anatomy and physiology coloring books do y'all remember those they were these okay they're too young they probably never saw them but they were like these intricate a and p um drawings that were for adults so you could actually be studying at the same time see that plug for studying i just I quietly gave i like that focus and regroup and i keep saying i'm going to learn to do something like needlepoint or something like that because it I ha I have to do something with my hands while I talk or while I listen. And it would help me to focus as well. So Jane, what should we do during the break? What should they do, not us? We're working. That's our job. Well I think it's always hard uh when you've got a wee break to um plan things, but plan some fun things um with your family if you have children. Um, something to look forward to, you know, even, you know, what's it called? They call them in Florida a staycation, even if you can't afford a vacation because you spent all your money on books and FNU fees and such that having a staycation, doing something fun, going to the local park or um, going to okay, a local I'm going museum. to diverge on that briefly. I'm going to interrupt. There's this great comedian, I love her, who talks about staycations. And she says, no mother ever came up with this concept to stay at home and relax. Because <laughs> while the children are running out to the pool or getting to go to Six Flags for the day or whatever, the mother is cooking the next meal and washing the clothes. And it's, okay, sorry. That was a great well, idea. Go ahead. Well, it's true, actually. My mother, uh, my dear mother had seven of us and uh, her her vacation, and this is a true story, as soon as we were able to take care of ourselves, her vacation was actually not going on vacation with us. So my dad took us all on vacation and my mom stayed at home. And oh, I bet that's the bomb. So, Sometimes there you I'm go. Like, I could have three days by myself in my house. Yeah. Oh. So, but yeah, do, do um, you know, do try and speak to your family and friends during the semester so they still know who, who you are and keep try and keep in touch with them a little. Um, while you're very busy in school because you want to be able to um, have those relationships when you're not in school. So do do value them, even though it's only a quick check-in on Facebook or a quick text message, you should try and keep up with your old and valued friends and family as well. So the next question that we had previously collected that we wanted to address is, could we give some ideas for maximizing self-study in distance education? Like how can we maximize our time and our study habits and et cetera. How can we make the most of it? So, um, first off, some of you, I'm excited that some of you are coming to Frontier Bound in um, November or sometime between now and the beginning of the year. So you're getting some great tips now. And for those of you who are already students, please remember that, um, that the Google Calendar is pretty much the bomb. Um, you can put everything on there. My, a few minutes ago when we were getting things loaded up, my calendar goes off to remind me that I'm supposed to be in here go, get doing things. And so I constantly, I use it religiously. It will help you keep up with assignments. And I even put on there, I don't just put 
things like due dates. I also put things like blocks of writing time or study time or work time and so that so that it's blocked off of the calendar so that I have contracted with myself that I'm going to put this time in. And I would say believing that you are actually going to need to study is an important concept and mapping out your time to do that, not just leaving it to happenstance and saying, oh, Oh, I'll get in the I'll get in there this week, but map out what you're gonna study. Take the time to get yourself organized and map out what readings you're gonna do, what um study guides you're gonna work on, what it, um assignment you're gonna do, et cetera, because uh, that will make the most of your time if you can organize your time appropriately. And yeah, we do all say it's in the syllabus or it's in the catalog. Um sorry. Uh, we we try to make sure everything is where it's accessible to you, but make sure that right at the beginning of the term you get yourself well organized, well organized so that you've got all your due dates down, so that you've mapped out your readings and your time, et cetera, so that you don't then later in the term find yourself behind. Um, it's it, I always, and this sounds pessimistic, and I'm not actually a pessimist by nature, I don't think, but I always assume something bad is going to happen, so I better get ahead just in case. Um, I, I very rarely, not not never, but I rarely find myself behind for that reason because I don't like to think that that I'm going to have an emergency and not have something done. And so whenever possible, I try to ha give myself earlier deadlines on everything just so if something happens, I'm ready for it. And I, I just wanted to speak to that for um, one minute. I would say when I'd have pregnant patients and they'd say, well, this is a stupid question. I'd say, well, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And there's certainly no such thing as a stupid question in school. If you're having an issue with Typhon, you're having an issue with Canvas, it's okay to ask about it, you know, and don't wait. You know, if you're having an issue with accessing, you won't be using Typhon, most of you yet. But there are some times in Canvas that things look contradictory or you don't understand it. And the only stupid thing is not to ask because we can clarify things pretty quickly. And there may be occasionally your professors may actually make an error on the syllabus or in Canvas. There may be contradictory Absolutely. information. So hey, don't be shy. If you think something's not clear to you, then it may not be clear to your colleagues either. And don't wait for three or four weeks, as Tanya said, getting into the semester and then you're like, well, I never went on Typhon because I couldn't understand it. Um, please ask early because we'd love to we'd love to hear from our students. I'm sure we all we all can say that we do love to hear from you. Christina, I love that. When my oldest was in high school, the students could sign up to get a nagger who would call them every other day to ask if they were on track. I am a professional nagger. Now I ha I'm pleased. I could get hired for this because this is what I do in the lives of many people. I'm a nagger. Professional. Um, I use lists all the time. I'm a crazy list maker. So this actually, I'm going to show you. I start a new notebook at the beginning. Now I use, I actually have three calendars and I keep them all in sync together. And I buy a big notebook at the beginning of each term because I like to, my list, my daily list, I like to have written down. So this is the, just, this is what I started on Monday. Now remember Monday that I didn't get home until whatever time I went to bed. So I actually started this Tuesday. So this is from Tuesday and today is Wednesday. Some of this is not accomplished yet, by the way. It's things that I need to get done to there. So I have it in front of me at all times. I like a list. And sometimes even after I've done something, I add it to the list so I can mark it off um, because it makes me feel good. So little by little, and that um, everything from my to-do <laughs> to -do list from yesterday, I literally move it to the next day. So I have things from yesterday's list that I moved on to today, and a couple of them that I knew because of the time of day that it is, I've already moved on to tomorrow's list. So I'll, I'm a lister. And, and Michelle must have found Mandela, Mandela, Mandala coloring books. So those are the ones, the anatomy ones. Is that what those are, Michelle? That we were talking about earlier. 
I always like um, this this picture because I think I'm so proud to work at Frontier, and I I, I am acutely aware of the fact that we we began distance education before the internet existed, and so I think that that it's it's not a, a secret that we're the number one midwifery program in the country, and um, there's there's good reason for that. There have been expert systems designed, and Frontier is constantly improving. You know how they support students and staff and faculty and so there are a wealth of resources if you've not been to bound yet you'll learn about them and those students who are here who far along who are far along in the program will attest to them but it doesn't matter how many resources we have if, if we're not all aware of them and if we're not using them so student services your advisors the library staff the IT staff I, I hope that you all share the my sentiment that every, every group of support um, staff team, they're they're incredible. I've never been I've never needed something where someone didn't greet me with a smile and have the skills and resources needed to help me do what I needed to do. So um, please know what your resources are and realize that there's nowhere you can get in this program where there's not extra support for you. So the biggest mistake you can do is is not reach out to ask for who who's available to help. Regina, that's a great question. How, with all my daily lists, do I keep the ultimate goal in mind? Some days, most days, really, I get overwhelmed with everything and feel I'm not going to make it or I forget my ultimate final goal. I do prioritize my list. Now, I can't, because of the way I write it, I can't physically move it about and prioritize it. But when I make my list, um, and I've actually started tomorrow's list already, like I said, with the things that I didn't finish today, um, when I do, when I'm looking at my list in the morning, though, depending on how many resources I have at my fingertips, whether I just have the pen that I'm using or the highlighters, usually or the colored pencils. I love colored pencils. I think they're the best thing ever. I will um, circle or star or highlight like one or two things that I absolutely have to do. And so what I'll do sometimes I can't work long enough on that one project to complete it at one time because, uh, like I said, I'm a little ADHD. So I'll work on it a while. I won't mark it out, obviously, because I'm not done. And I'll go on down and do a quick, a few quick things that I can mark off because that makes me happy. And then I'll circle back. And so I circle back at least at the middle of the day and at the end of the, the day to the big stuff to see where I am on it. And like I said, on my calendar, I literally block out little blocks of time to work on specific things. that, Like I had a big project this morning that I needed to work on. And so... Um, I block my calendar and I turn my email off so I wouldn't continue to answer email. Like I just took it down off of the screen. Otherwise, I could get distracted easily. I don't know if that helped, Regina, but that's some of the tips that I use. When I first started, I was afraid to bother. This is Heidi talking. I was afraid to bother an instructor or the library. Now I know that everyone is super helpful and kind. Don't ever be afraid to talk to someone. I agree. Um, and then Christina says, I make a second list of accomplishments. Good job at the end of the day so I don't feel discouraged. Awesome. I wanted to say, Diana, when you're talking about all the different resources, it's funny. Like when somebody says, I see, I'm like, oh, I love, I see, I see, it's wonderful. I just love them. Blah, blah, blah. And then somebody says something about the kitchen staff. Oh, my God, the kitchen staff is so wonderful. They'll just do this. And, this. and then somebody says, library. Oh, my gosh, have you tried to use the library? They will just get you anything. It's, I mean, it's like you said, every time a group is mentioned, they really – work hard to meet our needs, which is perfect. I like this graphic because in thinking about how to maximize self-study in, in distance education, I think that, you know, in through the years of working with students and faculty, the, the, the thing we consistently find in, in what leads students to be successful is that they're constantly self-appraising. We all have weaknesses, all of us, all of the faculty. We're continually improving, and we're constantly out trying to learn new skills and improve um, ourselves to, to be better teachers and better clinicians, and, and we want to teach you how to do that. So embracing, you know, where you may feel weak or where you don't feel strong and, and filling those gaps and constantly looking for mentors who can help you or experiences and, and not expecting school to provide all those experiences. One of the beauties of distance education is that you can be anywhere in the world doing these things throughout 
different phases of your education. So um, really searching out those dark corners where you're not feeling strong and embracing um, different ways to fill those gaps. Heidi mentions that the SAGE um, Facebook page has started now too. So that is for the mentoring program, student to student mentoring. So if you're interested in that and you have not um, gotten anything about that yet or you're, you've lost it or whatever, I'm going to type in the name. It's Wilvina. Oh, Lord, what's Wilvina's last name? McDowell, Dowell. Mc... Hang on, I'll find it. I just call her Wilvina. She's my friend. Let's see, Wilvina's last name. I, th I thought it was McDowell. McDowell. It's McDowell. McDowell. A good Scottish <laughs> name. Wilvina McDowell is the um, will help with that. Or anybody from Student Services, your advisor can help direct you, direct you to the right person. But um, you will find that sometimes just having another person that's in the trenches with you can help too. I like this graphic. Um, it reminds me of when I was directing the birth center. I kind of I had a rule that. You know, I'm, I'm open door. You can come to me anytime. But if you're coming about an issue, I want you to come tell me what the issue is and tell me the first three things you did to try to fix it and then come to me because um, I'm happy to help. But on that level, and that's what we need to do for each other here at Frontier, too. So anything that you come across as far as um, an area of improvement, whether it be in yourself, in your a group of colleagues, in a committee, in a course. We've got to work to, together and commit to each other that for this institution, we're going to be a community that proposes solutions and that is constructive because this is your playground while you're here to develop your leadership skills to go out and change the system. And so please always remember this as you're going through the course that and through all of your different courses that um, we want continuous feedback, um, but always find the edge of what is the feedback and what is the solution and be part of that solution. I would love to speak to this. Um, having recently become a home office convert. Um, I don't know if any of you ever get uh, holiday gifts, but um, I really enjoy having um, obviously a separate place if you can afford that to have a separate room and you can see this very nice um, slide that Diana uh, developed a very comfortable chair as uh, Tanya said you're going to be getting up and down every hour but having a, a very comfortable chair I'd like to speak to the value of tablets which I have mine right here because I tend to do my Google Hangouts on a tablet, which is really great because then it's separate from your laptop. So you can work on documents while you're having a meeting with your colleagues when you're studying. You can be working on your um, joint projects and things like that. Having an ability to make it peaceful and quiet, um, get going along from what Tonya said of blocking off times, especially if you have children um, that you need to say, I am actually studying and this is my workspace and I need peace from 9 to 11 a.m. to get this paper knocked out. And, um, you know, hopefully you've got a window so that you can get some uh, beautiful uh, sunlight coming through. Um, and, and being aware of what technologies, avail technologies are available. If you're not sure, um, you can certainly ask your colleagues. A lot of you obviously have better IT skills than we do, but we have wonderful IT um, people that if you are, if you're working through the problem, you've asked your family, you've asked your friends, you've asked your student colleagues, and there's something about your setup that's not working, you need to contact um, IT. And as, as Tonya has got a good point about case days, always have an alternative. There's always somebody that's microphone doesn't work, so be able to know how to use the telephone to call into big blue button and things like that. And um, Heidi helpfully says, I have a separate room to study in. It is essential for me. I also keep a drawer. That's a good point, a good a good uh, thing. I'll need to do that. I have a drawer with healthy snacks in it so I won't forget to eat. Um, but yeah, trying to have a separate um, place with like a working printer, a working laptop. And if somebody 
you know, if somebody wants to buy you a gift while you're in school, either a nice textbook or a nice piece of technology, such as a headset or a, a tablet that can really um, make your life a lot easier. I just want to mention that um, we now with Proctorio, we see videos of people taking their tests. And it is no joke that there are students taking tests in the bathroom because that's the only space they have in their home. Um, and so we're really trying to encourage you to have conversations up front with your family about the validity of what you're doing and your need for space. If you can't have an extra wing, we get it. But there, you have what you're doing is valuable and important, and um, you should not be taking tests sitting on a toilet because that's the only place you can get away from your family. Good job, Ginger. Ginger said last semester I was in a camper trailer in the backyard with a space heater, but she's upgraded to an office this year. Excellent. But I'll tell you what, at least that camper trailer, you probably had some quiet. That's good. Heidi says, my kids ask me why I get two rooms in the house. My reply, I pay for this house. I deserve it. You go, girl. That's so true. This is just more about taking care of yourself and making a good chair is so important and sitting appropriately so that you're not chilling your back. And And finding yeah. systems and ways to just remind yourself to to get up every now and again, get more blood flow to your brain. This is one of our faculty members on their home office. <laughs> so we're having a competition to see what your home office looks like. Yeah, mine doesn't look like that, but I am considering getting a um, a desk like that for the, so I can walk a little more and beat you a little more often. Well, we, um, we're all real people here. We're real. We want you to be real. Um, and we want together to to be a family and a team and a community of learners and midwives and midwives to be. And so um, it's important to approach things with this kind of attitude that these are the things that we do and it matters. The, the way that we treat one another really matters and it sets us up for for our whole careers and the expectations for ourselves and our own behavior and the expectations that we have for other people's um, behavior. So I want to, I always like to end hopefully on a positive note. Now, unfortunately, sometimes this is what we see. Yeah, my, um, I don't know about you, but my, um, well, actually my picture is really the same, but my weight is just a great big fat lie on my um, driver's license. But change does happen. You used to be a little, um, just a little, uh, Oh, good Lord. What turn, a caterpillar. I, I was, what turns into a butterfly? But look at what you're doing. You're growing and you're changing and you're becoming. You're becoming midwives. And um, we're so honored and excited to be a part of that. We've got a few minutes left, so I want to give you all a chance to ask questions. Um, you can do this. So, you know, I, I left allowed when I looked at these slides because Diana knows me so well and she put at the bottom Tanya sing or something sing or something well those of you who know me know that I'm going to do that no matter what so remember that believe in yourself because I believe in you now what are your questions what dirt do you want to ask us about what do you need to know inquiring minds And 
while we're waiting for a quick question, I just wanted to mention the importance of the culture of civility at Frontier Nursing University. The culture of civility is a wonderful thing which we all practice every day and it applies to all of us. It applies to the students, it applies to the staff, it applies to the faculty, the dean and the president and we all try to treat each other in a civil and kind manner and it's very important to me to be part of an organisation that really cares about how we treat each other. So I'll read the comments out. The day is not complete until Tonya sings to us. And um, Chris says, this has been a great to listen to and very inspiring as I'm just starting my journey. And we're so happy to have you on board, Chris. We're all, we're all very involved in your success. San Sadie says, I keep worrying about missing something. Do people adjust to this pretty well and or quickly? And um, I'll just quickly answer that. I think are you I think you're probably talking about um study habits and uh midwifery. I wouldn't worry about adjusting too quickly. I think it 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 takes a long time and I'm sure Diana and Tonya can speak to this as well. Um after I I qualified as a midwife, I think it was like when I learned to drive my car, I kept thinking there was somebody else beside me helping me and then when you're actually qualified it's kind of sad because there often isn't someone there to talk to. So do spend the time. Don't race through your whole time at school. Value what you're learning and um, value having a preceptor and, and a wise person beside you to talk to because that will make you um, feel better about what's going on. But I think um, I think most people adjust um, pretty quickly to it. And there's a good question. Kelly asks, do all of our clinics, clinicals have to be with a CNM? Or can we do a portion with an MD? Well, um, I think all of you here, unless I'm mistaken, are student midwives and you should be doing um, all your labour and delivery with um, midwives. And um, I'm sure Tonya will correct me if I'm wrong. You can do some clinic time with a physician. However, you can a very small amount, but we don't really like you to count that as your hours. We like you to count your hours with your midwifery colleagues because you're learning midwifery. Doctors aren't taught in America, for those of you who don't know, they're not taught how to um, do normal births. That's why you shouldn't be working with physicians. That's not part of their competency and your competencies are based basically on normality. So we want you to be working primarily with midwives. And Sadie, oh, the online format, I, I don't want to, I'll, I'll let Diana or Tonya speak to that. And yes, Michelle, this port, this is being recorded. So I'll shut Sadie up now. Asking, um, I think Sadie was asking specifically whether or not the um, people adjust to the online format quickly. Um, most people do, Sadie, I think they do. The courses, we're using a Canvas platform, which is the learning management system. You may have seen things like um, Angel before, or you may have seen, um, uh, Blackboard, uh, is that right, Blackboard? But this is the learning management system, and it's it's pretty straightforward, I think. Things are organized in modules. There's a course calendar in each course. So getting yourself together and getting that organization done is key to that. And that way you can then relax back off of it and because you've got yourself organized. I would say don't delay on that. If there's one thing probably that I would say do um, religiously is right at the beginning of the course, get yourself organized. Otherwise, it's so easy to just kind of be rocking along and realize that you've missed something and then, then you do have a mess on your hands. Um, Regina says, how do I not get frustrated with the current practice I'm doing under MDs as an RN while learning more about, more about midwifery care and patient-centered evidence-based care? I think the frustration to some degree is normal because it's growing pain. Um, our, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we've used. And that means even within your hospital setting, the same thinking, we have to start to think differently. And that's what you're doing. You're beginning to think differently and look at things differently. And that's okay. Um, and yes, it will be frustrating and it will be hard. And some days you just will want to leave crying. But what I would encourage you to do is to think about the one, the woman that you are with right then. 
What can you do that day within the system to assist her, to support her, to be in service to her? While you may not be equipped at this point or in a position at this point to make great big change, and you're probably not, that's just the truth of, of most of the politics in the job um, in a hospital setting, and especially in a medical type model, you can make a difference for that woman that you're with. You can be kind to her. You can advocate for her. You can help educate her. So I would just say baby steps right now and remembering, um, remembering that what not to do later when you have the capability to make real change. Um, so Gretchen says, I'm probably a black sheep. In this group, I'm not yet accepted, but I'm very excited about midwifery and recently have been thinking about applying. My question is, how much time do you have to decide and narrow down your clinical sites? I may not be living in the same location. Um, you have to have you have to have your clinical site confirmed before you can be assigned a clinical bound date. And the clinical bound date is generally for a full-time student in term six, seven. It's a little, it's like the next term for a part-time student, and each term is 11 weeks. So we're talking about a year and a half or so to two years into the program. So it does take a little while to have a clinical site credentialed if it's a brand new site to us. And we have lots of students who are, who move. Like we have lots of military students who don't know until closer to time for clinical exactly where they're going to be. If you have a region, it's great to start as soon as possible. Obviously, that's the ideal, but it, your situation is certainly not um, rare. Um, and we have more black sheep. Yay! Um, good job, Ginger, for answering approximately 12 to 18 months into the program. You want to have that site secured. Heidi says, how many people actually work during clinicals? Do you have suggestions? I would say probably a lot of people work during clinicals, but they work um, limited amounts, either PR and a part-time. Because what you have to think about is that learning is, um, it builds, it's scaffolding. It builds upon each other. So you can't be in clinical sites. And I need to let Diane and Jane answer this. They're better at this mind. But you, you really can't go into a clinical site one day this week and then work the rest of the week and come back one day next week and expect to start where you stopped the week before. You can't. You're going to go backwards. Your learning has to, you have to repeat, especially skills. You have to repeat skills um, repetitively in a short amount of time to get proficient at them. So to think that you're going to go to clinical one day a week and, and be successful, first off, you're never going to get done. But secondly, you're not going to achieve skills. So I would say at minimum, you would want to be able to be in clinical at least two to three days a week um, in order to make clinical progress. Diana, you've had lots of experience with students as an RCF. What would you say to that question? Yeah, I, I mean, I, com I just completely agree that um, it's worth immersing yourself in order to invest in the continued learning and and keep the the um, skill development in in motion. Ginger has a great plan to build up her PTO and try to work one day a week and add the PTO to bridge the gap. That's a great plan. That's almost exactly what I did um, when I was in clinical. I had not really. I'm just not a vacationer, um, and so I had not really taken any time off and had been at the job for a few years and so had some time built up. Continued to build it up. And then what I would do, because I, if I, if you remember from earlier in the um, presentation, I would go to, I'm sorry, somebody just texted me a lab result. I need to look at it in a minute. Let me turn this down so I don't look at it right now. Um, I would go to clinical for three to four days, and I would come home for a day or two and go back. So what I would do is out of two weeks, I had always been one of those six on um, however many off that ended up being people. So I would come home and work like two to three days in a row for the two-week period and then have the other time off. And that worked for me, it was, you know, it, it because it worked for my clinical site. So I think that's a great plan. This particular um, slide I just want to point out to you because we're giving you the tools so that when it comes time to go in and sell yourself, you will um, 
have the tools to put it, put it together and be ready to do it. Heidi says, so if you're able to dedicate more time in clinical, you will probably finish earlier and have the repetition for skills, probably so. So here's what I would say are the minimums. It is a minimum of 16 hours now, 16 weeks in clinical. Now, I will tell you this. In the last eight years, I can recall two students getting done in 16 weeks, and they were in unusual sites and unusual students. It takes most people six to nine months in clinical to complete clinical. That is just totally normal, and it takes some people longer than that based on their other um, commitments as well as the learning curve. For example, if you're not a labor and delivery nurse, there are skills that you have to learn that you're not bringing to the table that are going to acquire. They're going to take some time, and that's okay. But you know that you might be on the longer end of that simply because you have those other skills to learn. Um, labor and delivery nurses, sometimes the obstacle for you is making the role transition. You have worked as a labor nurse. You are an expert at that. But to go back to being a novice in clinical is an uncomfortable place, and sometimes that role transition is more difficult for you. So, um, so the average time for clinical is six to nine months. So just FYI on that. And I just wanted to concur, um, Heidi, you're entirely correct, but you know we're not running a competition at Frontier to see how quickly uh, you can finish. And please remember the word minimum is not maximum. And again, going back to the point I made before, it's very nice to have a wise person beside you because when you're in, when you're out and you're qualified, you may be by yourself and you think, well, I wish I'd actually taken a you know another few months to learn these skills because you're not going to see every different risk uh, factor show up. And if you are in it for longer, it's not a failure. It's actually you're probably going to turn out a better rounded midwife if you take your time in clinical and learn as much as you can and see all those things instead of saying, well, I finished 7.13 in a record time and off to 7.14 and, you know, you, it's not a competition. So take your time and learn as much as you can because your preceptors love to teach. That's why you're, that's why their preceptors are fantastic. You know, these are excellent um, people to learn from. So don't try and rush through clinical as quickly as you can. But yeah, um, Michelle's just saying, I think PTO slash PRN part-time will work, but I might have to also up the loan amount to pay the bills, LOL. But yeah, yeah. Don't, don't kill yourselves. Please uh, please take your time, learn, and be kind to yourselves and your preceptors. It has been so fun to be with you guys today. If you have other questions, please go ahead and pose them. We'll try to answer them. If not, we'll close the session out. But it was um, it was really a pleasure. It was fun, Diana, Jane, fun to be with y'all and fun to be with all these students. It's great. Much success to you all. Look forward to having colleagues, new colleagues in the profession.